Hello. This lecture and presentation is intended to give you a brief history and overview of self-portraits and give you some context as you prepare to approach your own self-portrait in the first studio project assignment. I'll also give, go over and provide some examples of artists, both masters and contemporaries, whose work focuses on the incorporation of the self in a variety of ways. So we can't talk about self-portraits uh, without talking about selfies. So selfie photography is generally thought of as a cultural mass phenomenon of the early 21st century that's inextric inextricably connected to smartphone advancements with integrated cameras. We see selfies everywhere from people taking selfies at art galleries or museums or people walking along the trail. It is part of our culture. Um, here we see an example of Yayoi Kusama's Infinity Mirrors exhibition, where in several of her infinity rooms, selfies were part of the process. Viewers were invited into the infinity rooms and to take a selfie of themselves within that environment. So the selfie became part of that artwork, it became almost a performative element of that experience. Now this has shifted. Just a few years ago, photography full stop was not allowed in galleries or museums. It was prohibited. And now we're seeing more galleries and more museums not only allowing photog photographs, but allowing individuals to take selfies with artworks behind them. And this is new and a, a direct response to this new phenomenon, I should say. It's not a new phenomenon anymore. It's here to stay. Now we may think of selfies as new, but the earliest self-portraits have actually dated back to ancient Egypt. And since the 15th century and the advent of the mirror, artists have modeled for themselves in their own works of art. Whether it's an in-depth exploration, the artist's own psyche, or simply because as a model, the artist is clearly the cheapest and most available subject matter. Uh, but whatever the reason, nearly every artist in every medium, from painters to sculptors, etc., have attempted the exploration of the self. Now you might even argue, argue that any form of art making in a way is self-expression because the artist is putting themselves into the work that they're creating. However, creating an intentional self-portrait that focuses on that self, whether it's purely representational or again, it's diving deeper into an, a more expressive um, or uh, revelatory action of the psyche or emotional state of the artist, uh, uh, there is a sense of self in every artwork that's created. So let's take a look at artists who are known for incorporating the self into their work. And of course, we have to start with Frida Kahlo, who is a Mexican painter um, who was born in 1907, uh, who did not exclusively work in the self-portrait. Frida Kahlo was a portrait artist, uh, but heavily focused on the self. Uh, Kahlo used vibrant colors in a style that was influenced by the indigenous cultures of Mexico, as well as by European influences that included realism, symbolism, and surrealism. Now, symbolism was a reoccurring theme in Frida Kahlo's works, and these works symbolically expressed her own pain, her identity, or her experiences. Frida Kahlo was also an early artist to incorporate text into her work, and this text allowed the viewer an insight into the concept behind the work. But many of her pieces relied on symbolism, Images that really connect to an idea, feeling, or emotion, such as the center image, Henry Ford Hospital, which depicts an experience, a painful experience of miscarriage that Frida, that Frida Kahlo uh, went through. Now, Kahlo suffered many tragedies throughout her life. 
uh, from having polio as a child to nearly dying in a bus, bus accident as a teenager. And this bus accident and the, the effects that she suffered impacted her for the rest of her life. This accident caused multiple fractures of her spine, her collarbone, and her ribs. She suffered a sh shattered pelvis, a broken foot, and a dislocated shoulder. Now, while she was recovering from this accident in a full body cast, she began to focus heavily on painting herself. While she was, um, she was in a bed in her cast with a mirror above her, she would paint her own reality. And this is something that Frida Kahlo always talked about, that she painted her own reality. In her lifetime, she had 30 different operations to try to repair the damage and pain caused by this body accident. It's something that plagued her her entire life. And the visual expression of this ongoing pain can be seen in this 1944 painting, The Broken Column, where we see this visual depiction of brokenness and separation of, of the spinal cord, this column being damaged. We see tears, symbolic of pain and suffering. We see these nails throughout the body. This is an example of the symbolic use and very direct use of, of expression, of visually expressing the pain the artist felt within. Now, life experience in general is a common theme in Kahlo's approximately 200 painting sketches and drawings. Her physical and emotional pain are depicted starkly on canvases. Part of this life experience involves her turbulent relationship with her husband and fellow artist Diego Rivera. And this tumultuous relationship can be witnessed throughout her paintings. Of her uh, approximately 200 works, uh, more than 55 are self-portraits. So again, although she was not exclusively a self-portrait artist, it was a heavy theme that dominated much of, of her uh, collection of works. Next, we'll talk about Egon Schiele. Now, Egon Schiele was known to be a protege of Gustav Klimt and a major figurative painter of the early, early 20th century. His work was rooted in expressionism. And at the center of his artistic interest was the examination of his own existence. And we can see this examination in the countless self-portraits that he executed. Now again, Egon Schiele was not exclusively a self-portrait artist. He was a portrait artist and he captured the images of the people around him in his life, in his environment. But he did focus quite heavily on the self as a subject matter. Now, Sheely styled himself in his work and in letters as a sage and a clairvoyant and as a conduit with an intense sense of reality and truth. And this is a really interesting interesting fact about Egon Chile. And I wonder if, if this um, can be seen, the sense of how he portrayed himself or how he saw himself can be seen in his works of art. And I guess that's up to the viewer as well. Now again, Egon Chile was an expressionistic painter and he used eccentric gestures and facial expressions to convey the sense of urgency and of relentlessly interrogating himself, his sense of self, his self-reflection, and his own body. Now we can see this kind of exaggeration in the twisted body shapes and his elongated features that characterize much of his work, drawings and paintings. And we can see this here in the elongated torso, in the fingers that are elongated, in this kind of express, expressive look on the face that is really pushing beyond just representation and is diving deeper into a, a reflection of the self and the psyche. Now, much of his work, again, is, is self-reflection and is an examination, you could say, of the different elements of his identity, whether it be a sexual identity, emotional identity, um, and, and an expression of these matters. 
Now, in his brief light life that was cut short due to the Spanish flu, Egan Chile managed to create a collection of works that were groundbreaking for his time, making him one of the most formative and colorful figures of the Viennese modernism, even though he, he only worked for a short number of years. Now, Anna Mendieta is more of a current um, uh, artist, uh, uh, born in 1948 through 1985. And Anna Mendieta was a Cuban American performance artist, sculptor, painter, and video artist. So Mendieta's work um, uh, surpassed just the 2D media and incorporated several other mediums in her work. Now, a lot of this is because Anna Mendieta's work was time-based and ephemeral. In fact, she's known best for her earth body artwork, which was works that she, she executed within the environment and would, um, would be ephemeral, would be time-based, which uh, would not be permanent pieces of work and were based on the flow and change of the environment around her. Now, Mendieta was born in Havana, Cuba, and was exiled from her native country in 1961, just before the outbreak of the Cuban Revolution. Much of Mendieta's work expresses the pain and rupture of cultural displacement. Mendieta was also interested in the relationship between the female body and nature, and it, she explored violence, particularly violence that was done upon women. In the 1970s, Mendieta embarked upon her iconic series, Silhouettes, in which she Im immersed her, her own body with earthly material, making nature both the canvas, right, the tool in which the art is um, uh, uh, put upon, and the medium, right? So nature became not only the subject matter, but the tool she used to express her art form and to tell that visual story. In her early silhouettes, Mendieta laid in an ancient Zapotec grave, letting the natural forms uh, around her change and form that expression of connection between person and environment, between body and nature. Now, these again were ephemeral. They were time-based. They did not exist in perpetuity, but what did was the photographic documentation or the video documentation of the work, which brings into question, what is the most impactful? Is it the live performance? Is it the imprint and the ghost of the performance that carries on or the action? Again, thinking about these time based or ephemer ephemeral works that exist because we were able to document them. What holds more power? The action of the work or the memory of the work that we are left with? So again, since many of Mendieta's artworks were bodily performances based on nature and subject to the natural elements, wind, rain, etc., the ephemera that remain are just the traces of her original action. So for an artist whose career was built on imprints, ghosts, and impressions, this idea is very um, uh, relevant. Uh, it's visceral yet distant. It's bodily yet spiritual. Mendieta's images speak a language very distant from the artwork that we see in galleries and museums. It's, it goes beyond a representa represent representational image and really reflects the action of the artist and the process and action of art making itself and how that blends concept, process, execution, and final piece of art. Now, Anna Mendieta's overall goal was to move people out of their apathy and to provoke them to connect with each other over authentically 
uh, to connect with each other authentically and spiritually and to understand that we are essentially one with everyone and everything around us. Mandiana wanted people to be more aware of their indifference to such unsettling things as prejudice and violence. And we can see some of this in, in her works. Moving more again into more contemporary artists, uh, we reflect on Jean-Michel Basquiat. Now in the art world, self-portraits are a tool of personal expression. Often, an artist's work can capture how uh, one represents themselves, in addition to how they believe others perceive them. It's kind of a duality. For Basquiat, self-portraits brought great meaning, influence, and vision in how art can be representative and expressive of the individual experience, while playing on that duality of how one perceives themselves and yet how they may be perceived by others or by the community or by the scene. A motif that we see often in Basquiat's work is the isolated hero. Now these figures, these isolated heroes, uh, often take the form of a mysterious spiritual prophet or fearless warrior, self-assured in the way that they confront the viewer directly. It is a centered image, it is directly facing the viewer. Uh, in the example we see here, the untitled Red Warrior, it may be interpreted as a self-portrait, though not explicitly stated. The triumphal symbol of the Black artist conquering an unseen oppressor within the image is, is indicative of succeeding in an art world that was predominantly white. Now, Jean-Michel Basquiat was a young graffiti artist when he first began his career in the New York subway. And from the streets of New York to the walls of its most prominent galleries, Basquiat catapulted into international fame in his early 20s with his raw graphic artwork that incorporated a fusion of words, cartoons, and cultural references. Now Basquiat came under a lot of criticism for being too commercial once he received this popularity. And this followed much of his, his short career. Now during this time, Basquiat was also a friend of Andy Warhol and we could see uh, uh, works uh, that Andy Warhol and Basquiat did collaboratively, collaboratively quite frequently. Now Basquiat is one of the most admired artists to emerge from that 1980s art boom. And although he only painted for eight years, another short-lived career similar to what we saw with Egon Schiele, his place in the history of American art cannot be denied. Basquiat interjected the unique African-American and Latino experience into the elite art world. That again, in that time, was largely dominated by white uh, artists. Now, although Basquiat claimed he did self-portraits only very occasionally, self-referential elements can be found in most of his work. In his self-portraits, he explores his identity as an African-American man working within the difficult and selective artwork of New York during the 80s. Basquiat identified with racial injustices he saw and also with the victories of the great Black voices and individuals. Now we see here these two different interpretations of the self, self-portrait as a heel and self-portrait as a heel part two. Now, like we saw with Anna Mendieta and even Frida Kahlo, artists often work in series where they take one subject matter or one theme and interpret it in several different ways. And we can see this in, in these two examples of Basquiat's work. Now his work treated the idea of duality from different perspectives. We can see that duality of his, his lived experience and, and being catapulted into this art world of fame. Um, Basquiat often paired people with objects and words with images 
to show the opposite side of one and the same reality, playing on that sense of duality. He also revised ideas about black and white and light and dark, questioning conventional notions of good and evil, right? Thinking back about symbolism and the symbology of color and what white and black typically represent in terms of color theory. Now, this is just a note and a trigger warning that the next slide is uh, mentioning of suicide. So feel free to uh, fast forward um, about 30 seconds uh, if this is not a slide that um, uh, you feel comfortable uh, hearing about. Riding with death, seen here, came toward the end of Basquiat's life was one of the last paintings and some um, experts say that this in fact was his last painting though we don't really know Basquiat was a prolific painter in the short years that he produced and so it's hard to even date some of his works because again he was so expansive in his art making but some say that this in fact was his last painting. Now it features some common themes that run throughout most of his career it's also an example of how he combined inspiration from Renaissance Italy and traditional African art. Now this painting also has a sombering effect that it, this work is kind of the, the theme of this work, the concept of this work is enhanced knowing that this was one of the last pieces, if not the last piece Basquiat painted before he died by suicide. It shows a strong link with his personal outlook on life and the state of the world he lived in. Now, this is quite similar to that self-reflection notion of self-portraiture or embedding yourself in the work, and that it's an examination of the self, of the psyche, and how you can relate that onto the page, onto the canvas. And just a note, that if you or someone you know needs support, is distressed, or exhibits any type of concerning behavior, please know that you are not alone. The UAA care team is here to support you or anyone you know who might need a little bit of help, who is suffering or is going through a hard time. So you can contact the care team by giving them a call at 786-6065. You can email them, you can email me and let me know and I can put you directly in touch. Uh, there's also a couple of care lines and helplines that are 24 hours that you can text or call. Uh, and always, 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 if it's an emergency, please call 911. All right. As we move into current contemporary artists, we're gonna take a look at just a couple of more artists that are working today. Brooke Di, no Di, Brooke Di Donato <laughs> um, was uh, born in 1990 and is a current photographer who studied photojournalism at Kent State University. Now, Di Donato developed a body of personal work that questions the notion of realism induced by the photographic media. So similar to Frida Kahlo, who merged realism and surrealism, De Donato does the same thing. Now, Donato would describe much of her work as surrealistic and surrealistic photography. Her images propose scenes of everyday life distorted by visual anomalies steeped in a pastel or banal environment that calls back to the American dream of the 50s. Di Donato was born and raised in Ohio and is now based in New York City. Her work explores the complexity of human cognition and what happens when psychological anomalies manifest in reality. So in this way, Di Donato is placing viewers in the context of the narrative that has no beginning or end. Di Donato is forcing us to ask how did we get here? What happens next? And finally, can we go on? 
much of these images are open formed, which means they go beyond the composition. We know there's more going on than what meets the eye and that there's a whole scene behind that. And it's a way of really inviting the viewer into the work itself. Now you may pick up on similar themes that uh, several of the artists we've talked about are exploring this human cognition, what's happening in the psyche, what's happening psychologically. How can we interpret that visually? Or how do we challenge perception in a visual way? Uh, a recent series of Di Donato is A House is Not a Home. And this is a series of self-portraits conveying feelings of isolation and discontent experienced when the artist returned to their hometown in Ohio. The character in this series, it, a series of self-portraits, performs the role as a hyper-feminine version of the artist that is exploring an alternate reality. There becomes a cohesion then between the suburban backdrop, again, that kind of banal, pastel, sugary background of the suburban life and the struggle to psychologically acclimate to gender roles often found in the nuclear family structure. Now, when asked why Di Donato refers to her photography as surreal, she said, I think I use that word because it's so readily accessible for people. But when I look at a lot of my work, I actually don't feel like it is surreal because it's all based in reality. Everything is sort of familiar and it's almost a distortion of the familiar. So there's not anything particularly fantastical about it other than maybe the narrative that's playing out or the position of the subject in the context of that reality. Again, similar to Kahlo, who although played with these different styles of surrealism, symbolism, and realism, would say when asked if her work was surrealistic was that she painted her own reality, which is similar to what Di Donato was saying with these works. Now, Di Donato, interestingly, often conceals the faces in her photography, whether of the artist uh, herself or other subjects of the images she makes. This could be done to democratize the figure. Uh, I mean that to say to have the figure represent the every woman or the every person. By um, concealing the face, there becomes a socialization of the personal. It may be a self-portrait, but it also can reflect any person who sees themselves in that image. It takes away the ownership that the artist has and gives that, uh, uh, shares that broadly to the viewer. They then can also own that message, that visual story. Next, we'll talk about Zanel Muhaldi. Zunel Mohali is also a currently producing artist and is one of the most acclaimed photographers working today. Their work has been exhibited all over the world. Mohali is a South African visual activist and photographer, and for over a decade, they have documented the Black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex, pe intersex people's lives in various townships in South Africa. Muhali's self-proclaimed mission is to rewrite a Black, queer, and trans visual history of South Africa for the world to know of our resistance and existence at the height of hate crimes in South Africa and beyond. In a more recent ongoing series, Samyam, Sanyama Nigonanyama, excuse my pronunciation, Hail the Dark Lioness, Muhali becomes both the participant and the image maker as they turn the camera on themselves. These images are confronting. They are uh, directly uh, confronting the viewer and forcing an examination of the work. Now, Muhali is experimenting with different characters and archetypes, and their self-portraits reference specific events in South Africa's political history. 
Through exaggerating the darkness of her skin tone, Muhali reclaims their blackness and offsets the culturally dominant images of black women in the media today. Now Muhali and their work have been targeted and Muhali has uh, been the victim of acts of violence. Their house was broken into and their hard drives containing their portraits of women were stolen. Now when asked about the experience and if Muhali was concerned about their safety after this home invasion and theft, Muhali said, I'm scared. I won't pretend not to be. But what is the alternative? This work needs to be shown. People need to be educated. People need to feel that there are possibilities. I always think to myself, if you don't see your community, you have to create it. I can't be dependent on other people to do it for us. It is a continuing resistance because we cannot be denied existence. This is about our lives and if queer history, trans history, if politics of blackness and self-representation are so key in our lives, we can, we just cannot sit down and not document and bring it forth. Muhali's self-portraits place the artist in the center, confronting the viewer. The portraits are self-aware and interrogative the portraits are serious reflections on the genre and the artist and the artist's place in it. As Muhali adapts different clothing and accessories, they slip into different facets of the characters they create. So uh, Muhali's self-portraits are as much of a reflection of the self, but also a reflection of culture and identity and uh, expressions of um, uh, 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 expressions of justice and education. Okay, just a few other contemporary artists uh, for you to explore because we don't have time to go in depth in all of them. But I encourage you to look at this list of artists as well who also work in self-portraiture and within the self. That art, those can, those are Alison Lapper, Cindy Sherman, Barkley Hendricks, Lou Bolin, Hannah Wilkie, Lydia Petit, and Jenny Saville. All artists that work and examine the self in their uh, artworks in a variety of mediums, photography to painting, to uh, multimedia practices. So after examining artists working in the self-portrait, I want you to start thinking about your self-portrait. So this assignment is to create a self-portrait that captures who you are and or where your arti artistic interests lie. This is, an, this is an investigation in the self. It's an examination of who you are. We just went through a list of artists who use the self in a variety of ways, whether it's self-investigation, calling attention to injustices and, and discrimination, reflecting on personal story, uh, interpreting pain, um, or, or putting a lens on the perception of society, a self-portrait can reflect a number of things. And I want you to really dive deep and think about who you are as a person or who you are as an artist and capture that in one image, in one art piece that is no smaller than eight by 10. It can be as big as you want, but no smaller than eight by 10. And it has to be done two dimensionally, but in any two dimensional media. Now these works will be evaluated for a degree that goes beyond the casual, unconsidered selfie. I want this to be an exploration in the self. And the theme is up to you. How you wanna explore that is also very independent and up to you. Now again, it needs to be a two-dimensional solution, but unlike some of the other assignments that we're gonna do this semester, that medium is up to you. So it can be a drawing, it can be a painting, a photograph, it can be a, a collage, it can be uh, a video uh, uh, animation piece. Um, it could be mixed 
material as long as it's 2D or com computer generate uh, or com or you know computer digitally generated um, image. So it's pretty broad. Um, if you have a question on whether your media is uh, uh, eligible to use, just shoot me an email. And again, the portraits can be no smaller than eight by 10. Now, like we saw in many of these artists, um, your work does not need to be uh, self-portrait in terms of um, uh, capturing your likeness. Um, Self-portraits can also be presented through symbols or through different imagery. It does not need to necessarily be an image of your face or your body. It doesn't need to be figurative work. It can be um, expressive work. It can be abstract work. Uh, really think about how you want to express these notions of the self. Now we're going to use uh, Flickr Gallery for our critique gallery. And so your pieces, your final pieces have to be documented. They're digital works, just save them in a nice file. If they're analog works, if they're paintings, drawings, collages, etc., you must take a good quality photograph of that work. All you have access to is a smartphone. I have included a resource in ongoing resources on how to capture really great work, even just on your smartphone. So some things I want you to reflect on as you start to think about how you're gonna solve this problem of creating a self-portrait is kind of general overarching questions. What is communicated in a self-portrait? What attributes are reflected in the self-portrait works of the artists we review? Do any of these resonate with you? If so, why? If not, why not? What are you trying to communicate through this self-portrait? What are you trying to say? What's your message? How does the medium or style used impact the overall concept and meaning of the work? Why was it important for Anna Mendieta to do a series in the environment when that environment might wash away the work that was done? Why was that important? Why couldn't she just paint that, right? How is the medium crucial and how is the medium important and how does it impact the overall concept of the work? Another keynote is that in considering your approach to your own self-portrait, think about what the most important attribute, attribute, the most important message that you would like to convey to an audience is. And then how do you want to do it? What medium is the best medium to communicate that message and to communicate the theme and the intent of your work? So for this assignment, the how um, you are presenting your work is important, right? So if it's if you're taking an image, right, the documentation is also important because we need to think about quality. We need to think about craftsmanship. And uh, if you make a really great piece of art, but you document it poorly, that quality is going to suffer, right? If you're buying a muffin and there's a muffin that's wrapped beautifully, you're going to buy it over the muffin that smashed in its wrapper, even if that one smashed in its wrapper tastes better, because that quality, that presentation matters. So be just as careful with how you document and present your work than the thought you're putting into creating it. So how is it lit? What angle is it seen from? Is the image in sharp focus? Are you presenting it whole or fragmented? When you're thinking about creating the work, play with different ideas of how you're presenting yourself. Um, we didn't we didn't talk about Cindy Sherman. She's in the list of artists for you to look up. But artist Cindy Sherman is a self-portrait photographer who played with the ideas of costuming and props and settings and characters. Um, it, think about that. Think about how you want to present yourself and um, uh, and be broad and expansive. And then again, how many aspects of yourself are you, you are possible to communicate or do you want to communicate, right? You might tie in on one element that you want to express and that is the message of 
the self-portrait. Finally, we will be critiquing these, uh, these assignments. Um, those Flickr gallery critiques are, the link to those is on Blackboard. Once I receive your images, I will put them in the Flickr gallery and post that on Blackboard for you to access. I will also post some guidelines on how to critique work. Uh, the critique is an opportunity for us to provide positive and constructive feedback on your classmates' work. It's to talk about what worked well, what was easily understood, what maybe was confusing, what could have been done better, but it is intended to be positive and constructive. Now, because we can't see these works in person, we are relying on documentation, photographic documentation or digital documentation of these works. And I really rely on you to post the most authentic representation of these as possible. So please do not use any filters within your camera or your uh, phone that is going to not authentically represent your work. If you need to adjust lighting, etc., that's fine, but please do not grossly change the scale or the saturation or the tonality of your works uh, in your documentation. The documentation is to represent most authentically your piece itself. All right, please let me know if you have any questions along the way. Um, uh, this was a brief video uh, from Brooke D. Donato of uh, a video of one of her photographic images in the work. Please visit her website. So again, please email me if you have any questions. I look forward to seeing your self-portraits and have a great week.